Here we have a passage about the temptation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And temptation is something that we know about. We use the word tempt. Even non-Christians use the word tempt. Particular foods they might say are tempting. But what is temptation? Temptation is anything that moves you or seduces you away from obedience towards something that is evil. It could be absolutely anything that is seducing your heart away from the right course, away from obedience, away from what is good towards that which is evil. Temptation is never from God, for God tempts no one. We're told that quite explicitly in the Bible. But what is it that tempts us? Well, really, there are three sources of temptation. There's the world, there's the flesh, and there's the devil. The world, culture all around you, it's going in one direction, and it's enticing you to join it. Go with the flow. Don't stand counter-cultural. Counter Go with the flow. That's uh, the pressure from the world, from the people around you, what they say to you, their peer pressure. Come along with us. Come and join in with what we're doing. There's the flesh, a second source of temptation. That is the lusts of your own heart. That inside you and me, our nature is still twisted somewhat. There are still things that are, are wrong and out of joint. That's iniquity within us. That we want things, we desire things that are not good. Uh, and these lusts have to be subdued in the Christian. Uh, they have to be put to death. We have to fight against them. But they are there. Uh, they're there. If you're tempted towards certain sins, we shouldn't just say, well, it's all external. It's the devil tempting me to sin. But it's quite often it's your own desires for those things. Your own flesh wants these things. And instead of you blaming some external source, you have to take a hard look at reality and look within you and say, there's something in my heart that desires this, and that's not right, and that needs to change. So we have the world, external, we've got the flesh, internal, and thirdly, we've got the devil, which is the one particularly we're considering this evening. The devil here comes to tempt Jesus. But there's a danger, isn't there, in temptation because it takes us away from God towards what is wrong what is evil and what displeases God and, and when we think about it we, we tend to think that temptation it's a trifle it's not that bad how bad can it get a little bit of sin dabbling here and there it's not going to cause us much harm but friends Thomas Watson the Puritan called temptation the poisoned pill in sugar. If I told you that I had a pill that was poisonous and I was to offer it to you, you would say, no, thank you. But if I dip it into sugar and I show it to you and you look and you see the sugar and you think that looks sweet, it looks tasty, it looks delicious, you're seduced by the temptation. You see, it's promising you something that is sweet. But when you bite into it, what do you find? There's nothing in it but death. That's what temptation is. It's like the fishing hook. You can put the nicest bit of bait on it and the fish will bite because they want the bait. But what does it leave them with? A hook in the mouth. It's death. That's what temptation is. And we need to take it seriously. It is death. And this temptation here that we're looking at this evening, it's particularly the temptation of our Lord. From the perspective of Satan, the devil has come to Jesus in order to overcome him. Jesus, right before this passage, he has been baptized by John the Baptist. You can see that back in chapter 3. God declared about him, chapter 3, verse 22, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. The devil doesn't want Jesus to be the beloved son with whom God is well pleased. He, he wants to do ever, anything he can to bring Jesus down, to tempt him into sin. Because here's the fact, 
if Jesus had one small tint, if Jesus had one character flaw, even if it's just a minor one, Jesus would be disqualified from being a savior for you and for me. Just one sin. It's hard for us to get our minds around that because we have trained ourselves to think that sin is small. That's what we we train ourselves to thinking. But if Jesus had the smallest sin, the sins in your life and mine that we tolerate, if he just had that one little sin, only on one occasion, it would utterly disqualify him from being our mediator. And so Satan is seeking here to tempt Jesus, to pull him into sin, and to disqualify him from being the mediator. However, from the divine perspective, something different is going on here. From God's perspective, Jesus is, verse 1, full of the Holy Spirit, and he is led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Jesus has not decided just simply by himself, I'm going to go to the wilderness, but the Spirit of God has led him there. This is the divine plan for him. He's prompted by the Holy Spirit to go to this place in order to be tempted. God is permitting this temptation because God is testing Jesus. I don't know what you think when we, we, we use the word test, what, what you think of. Uh, we don't want to be tested, perhaps. Maybe you think back to days of exams, tests, and we think, no, thank you. But God does test. We're told in James 1, verse 13, that let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself test, but nor does he himself tempt anyone. That's true. God does not tempt. God does not seek to seduce you. God doesn't take sin and put a bait on it and like try to hook you into sin. He doesn't want you to sin. But he does test. He tests in the way gold is refined by fire to prove the worth of something. That's the way God tests. If you're a Christian, I'll just take a sidetrack for a moment. If you're a Christian and you go through a difficult time in which God is testing you, He's not doing it to kick you when you're down. He's not doing it in a vindictive spirit. He's not doing it out of hatred with your anger. He is seeking to do it to prove that the work he has done in you is a true work. That you are pure gold. And that you are being refined by fire. It's a redemptive work. And we should be thankful for that. God tests to prove that something is genuine. That the faith in you is genuine, that his work in you is real. And so too here with Jesus. From the divine perspective, the Spirit of God has led Jesus into the wilderness to not to tempt him, not to try to get him to sin, but God has led him there to test him, to prove that of all men that have ever lived, this man is the one who will not sin. He is pure gold. He is the real deal. And as we see, we'll see ourselves... As we study this, because God is testing him to show that Jesus is pure gold, therefore there is every reason for you and me to trust him. That should be the application, the immediate application of this passage. That we should trust this man, the Lord Jesus Christ. For as we'll see at the end of the passage where he does not give in to any of these temptations, it shows us there's no sin in Jesus. There's no holiness lacking in Jesus, but he is completely righteous. From the the divine perspective, of course, Jesus could not fail because Jesus was God. God cannot sin, and therefore it was impossible for Jesus to sin. He was tempted, yes, but it was impossible for him to sin. Now, we find that a little strange. Well, we can't quite get our minds around it because that we we tend to think well if it was impossible for him to sin how could it be a real temptation I can't really explain that to you because I've never been in the position of Jesus all I know what it is to be a man who can suffer temptation uh, and can fall into temptation or by God's spirit can resist temptation but Jesus as fully God could not sin and would not sin 
and therefore this test he is bound to succeed. Think about that for a moment, who Jesus is. Fully God and fully man. Jesus is not somewhere in between God and man. He's not a deified man or a humanized God. He's not a demigod. He's not like Hercules, if you've seen that movie or thought about that. He's not somewhere in the middle. A little less than a God, but a little more than a man. That's not who Jesus is. He's fully God and fully man. And Satan here is trying to tempt him, but God is proving that he will not sin. Satan's plotting his madness because he's destined to fail. But just because an army can't be defeated, it doesn't stop them being attacked. And that's what's happening here. Jesus was a sinless man. Jesus did not have a fallen nature like we do. You see, that's where the difference is between his temptation and our temptation. James 1 verses 14 and 15 says, But each one, when he is tempted, is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. You see, what is temptation? It's when you're enticed, your own desires are led astray. That should shame us, shouldn't it? That the sins that we commit are because there's a desire for it somewhere in our heart. Little roots or little seeds planted for those desires. And a temptation just has to come at the right time, the right opportunity to bring life to that or to stir up that desire and desire leads to sin and sin leads to death and so we need someone to deliver us because we can't deliver ourselves Paul says in Romans 7 uh, that there's a struggle constantly within him a battle between good and evil the good he wants to do is what he doesn't do and the evil he doesn't want to do is what he finds himself doing who will deliver me he says Who will deliver me from this body of death that is within me? He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And it's because Jesus is the God-man, the mediator, the one who passes this test. It's because of that that you and I can have success and victory over temptation. And that's what I want us to see this evening. Jesus was not tempted with inward fallen desires the way we are jesus's temptations were all external and let's consider uh, the temptations one by one the first temptation here the devil comes to him in verse three and says if you are the son of god command this stone to become bread here the temptation, and we, should, we need to take a step back and look at it. What is actually being said here? Right from the first word. Satan's doing what he always does. And, and you should see this in your own life when you face temptation. He's trying to cause you to doubt, to distrust. That the word of God calls you to trust fully in what God says. Believe him, take him at, at his word. Satan here says, if, if. He's planting that seed of doubt or trying to plant it. If you're the son of God. It's the same. He doesn't change, does he? In the Garden of Eden. Um, What did he say to Eve? Right right there in the beginning, didn't he? Did God really say that you can't eat of this tree? He's planting that seed of doubt. He's trying to question what is true. If you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. Now, this was a temptation because, as we see from the context, verse 2, Jesus was hungry. He was really a man, and therefore, having not eaten for 40 days, he was really hungry. Could you imagine that? What it would be like for you or for me not to eat for 40 days. Jesus was really hungry. He knew this human weakness. Although he is fully God, it doesn't mean he doesn't feel that human weakness of hunger and he had the power to turn a stone into bread 
We have no example of that in the scripture. It doesn't tell us ever that Jesus turned a stone into bread, but he multiplied loaves of bread to feed 5,000 people on one occasion and 4,000 people on another. Jesus has the sheer power to multiply bread. Jesus is the one who created the world. All things were made through him and for him. And so he has the power to take a stone and to turn it into bread, surely. Because he had the power to take clay from the ground and turn it into a man. He has this sheer power. And so there was no problem with him turning a stone into bread. He could do it. In one sense, um, there, there wouldn't have been anything wrong with it if Jesus had wanted bread to, to make bread. Except for this fact. Except that Satan is, is trying to cause Jesus to distrust the word of God and to trust in a different place. And Jesus replies very simply, verse 4, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. That comes from Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. They are the context, Deuteronomy. Israel is in the wilderness. They are wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years. God is testing them. He's humbling them. And he allows them to grow hungry. He allows them to, to be in a situation where they don't know where their next meal is going to come from. And here's a test. Is Israel going to trust in God? God will provide. He's leading us. We simply have to accept he'll take us in the right way. Or do they grumble and complain and say, God's not providing. It'd be better for us to go back to Egypt. What God wants Israelites to do is to see and to learn this lesson that bread, physical bread, is not more important than the word of God. Physical bread is not more important than the provision God supplies. But Israel failed the test. Israel grumbled for bread. They weren't content to wait for God. But Jesus here is totally different. Jesus here is content. Jesus is like the weaned child. We, we speak of in Psalm 131. And so Jesus trusts in God. God can provide. I don't need to do what Satan has to say. Would not the father who loved the son, back to uh, chapter 3, verse 22, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. If God really loves his son, will he not supply everything the son needs? Of course he will. Of course he will. And so Jesus is resigned to the fact God will provide. Where Israel demanded bread, Jesus denies himself bread because he is content in God. I want you to notice, and it's true with all of these temptations, Jesus responds, it is written, or it says. He goes back to the word of God. We all struggle against temptation. If you're a Christian, you're struggling, you're wrestling, you don't want to sin. That's a sign uh, that you are a, a, a new creation. That's a sign that God has done a work in you. If there's a fight within you, you want to be free of sin. A fight is a good sign. Uh, but we often fall. We often sin. And I think one of the reasons why is because we don't take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We don't take up the Bible and say, it is written. This is why I must not sin in this way. Because it is written, such and such. Remember the psalmist said, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Take the word of God and hide it in the heart. That means put it there. Put it deeply into the heart so that it becomes part of how you think, how you feel. The heart is the, the seat of who you are. It's the throne room, if you like. Put God's word so deeply in there that it dictates how you respond, how you think. And so that's one way of resisting temptation, getting that word of God and putting it deep into the heart. And it is possible. It is possible because James 4 verse 7 says, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. 
That's a promise given by God. He will flee from you if you submit to God, that is by submitting to God's word, then if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. If you're not submitting to God, you try to resist the devil, he won't flee from you. But by submitting to God, you will be able. So that's the first temptation where Jesus is tempted to turn a stone into bread. The second temptation comes next. Verse 5, the devil takes him and shows him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he, he makes a promise. He makes a promise to Jesus. I'll give you all of this authority, all of this glory. I'll give you anything here that you can see because it's been delivered to me. I have the authority, the devil says. Now he's lying through his teeth here, isn't he? He's the father of lies. But he, he's saying, this is mine and I have the authority to give it to you. Um, and so what you should do is worship me and then all of this is yours. All the kingdoms of the world in exchange for one moment of idolatry. Now, which one of us would be able to withstand this temptation? Would it not be just so easy to give in in order to get such power and wealth and authority? Can Satan give these things? Of course not. He has no rightful authority. He simply has an appearance of authority. It's an allure he's alluring them. It's, it's just the illusion of, of power to give these things. They're false promises. And we need to, to reckon with that, that all temptations are false promises. It's fleeting moments, passing pleasures of sin, but not lasting joy. Lasting joy is found at God's right hand. There are pleasures forevermore, Psalm 16. Sin gives you passing pleasures, a little bit of excitement for a moment but it's gone and it leaves behind shame and guilt and it leads to death it's interesting here satan's temptation to give the kingdoms of the world to jesus shows us that satan understood what jesus came to do jesus came into the world uh, to do the work of the mediator and he would receive the kingdoms of the world as his reward Think of Psalm 2. Uh, Psalm 2 echoes, uh, or, or what God says in, in, in the baptism account, echoes Psalm 2. You are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Psalm 2 says, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Uh, I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, and all the ends of the earth for your possession. Psalm 2. Satan knows the Bible. We see it here, how he, he'll go on, he'll quote from the Bible. Satan knows his theology better than many Christians know their theology. Although he twists it to his own advantage. Satan knows that Jesus will receive all the nations as a reward for going to the cross. And if only he can get Jesus to sin beforehand. If only he can do that. But Jesus replies, doesn't he? Um, he says there, verse 8, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. We read that, didn't we, in Deuteronomy 6, verse 13. There it goes on to say, You shall not go after other gods, the gods of, your, of the peoples who are all around you, for the Lord your God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you. From the face of the earth. Jesus knew this. Jesus is God. He knows the jealousy of God. That God is particularly jealous about his own worship. That we should not worship false gods. But also that we must worship God in the way that God has directed us to worship. And so for us to turn aside for, in one of these two ways. Is to arouse the jealousy of God. To call upon us wrath from God. Jesus answers the devil's temptation by making it very clear. There is only one to whom we should bow down. And that is to the Lord your God. It's interesting here that Jesus stands where Israel failed. We've got that throughout the temptation narrative. The comparison between Jesus and Israel. Israel in the wilderness wanted bread and demanded bread and grumbled that they did not have bread. 
Whereas Jesus is able to say, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Well, so too here, Jesus stands where Israel failed. Because he is able uh, to dismiss Satan's temptation, to say away with you, Satan. Whereas, what does Israel do? Israel, as the Bible shows us, they hoard after other gods. They turned aside. So many opportunities came their way. The nations around them, and they were enticed, and they were ensnared, and they were led astray. Israel failed, but Jesus did not. He stands solid and true because he's pure gold. And then the third temptation. The devil takes, verse 9, takes Jesus up to Jerusalem and to the pinnacle of the temple. And he again... Um, puts that word, if, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. Commit suicide. Cast yourself off. Because you won't really die. It is written. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. The temptation here is, is to presumption. To presumption. Uh, to take what you know to be true and to distort it. Satan here is showing himself to be an angel of light. He's masquerading here as an angel of light. He's pretending to be good. He's quoting from scripture. And yet the scripture is all out of context and distorted. It's, it's a psalm, Psalm 91, that tells us that God will protect the righteous. That God will protect those who trust in him. And since Jesus is the most righteous one who has ever lived, how could God not fulfill that promise in Jesus? That Jesus would be preserved and the angels would be given for him. But it's presumption. Presumption to say, well, if I, I can sin and God will still bless me. Are you ever tempted to presumption? Are you ever tempted to think I can give in to this temptation and it doesn't really matter. God will still bless me. It's nonsense. Because that is not how God works. He doesn't say you can sin so that grace may abound. No. And Jesus shows that he understands this. He says in verse 12, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. That's what this is. The devil is not encouraging Jesus to have faith in God's promises. He's causing him or trying to tempt him to presume upon God's promises. And to put God to the test. God can test you and me. But we should not test God. Not in this way. Not by presumption. Jesus understands that. And uh, it's that quotation there. It could be further from Deuteronomy 6 verse 16. You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him at Massa. Where there was a great thirst amongst God's people in the wilderness. And the question they ask is, is the Lord among us or not? See, that's, that's the way they were. Uh, they, they felt God's withholding water, therefore God's not with us. And God will have to prove himself before we'll believe in him. Instead of us taking in face value what he said, that he's going to provide for us, God has to prove himself to us. They're setting themselves over God. Jesus stands where Israel fails. Jesus proves himself to be real gold. And it's interesting, isn't it? And we'll sing this at the close of the service, this Psalm 91 that Satan mis, uh, misuses and abuses. Jesus could have corrected Satan from Psalm 91. Because Psalm 91, uh, yes, it does say that he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And yes, it does say on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. But it also goes on to say, you shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. And right from the beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3, we know that Satan manifested himself as the serpent. As a snake. And in Revelation, Revelation chapter 20, he's described in that same language yet again. Psalm 91, that Satan misuses, promises the downfall of Satan himself. 
you will tread the serpent, trample him underfoot. Isn't that what Genesis 3 says? In that great promise of the gospel, that first promise of the gospel, that the seed of the woman, that is Jesus Christ, would crush the head of the serpent. Jesus would stand and Jesus would have the victory. And friends, that's why you and I should trust him. What we read here in Luke 4 gives us many helpful tips for understanding temptation. There's much more that could, could be said. You could read books like the screw tape letters or precious remedies against Satan's devices and you'll see that Satan is so subtle uh, and he, uh, he uses all sorts of schemes and, and sometimes we can be taken in by them. And there's a lot that the Bible teaches us about facing temptation. And we can learn a lot from this passage. But this passage is not merely a textbook manual on what to do in temptation. You know when something goes wrong in your car and you get out the, the manual and you look it up and you see what does that warning sign mean? And it'll tell you exactly what it means and exactly what's meant to be done to fix it. That's not what this passage is merely designed for. It does do that in part, but it does far more than that. Because this passage is showing us something more significant. It's proving to us that Jesus is real gold. It's proving to us that he stands sinless, perfect, and undefiled. And the only way that you and I uh, can avoid sin, the only way that you and I can defeat temptation, the only way that we can withstand Satan and his many schemes is by abiding in Christ. Only in Jesus can we have the victory. We can try in our own strength, but here's what you're going to find, just as Paul found in Romans chapter 7. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Try to resist temptation in your own strength. Try to go cold turkey. Try to stop sinning right this evening. Say no more, I'm not going to sin. Use all the resources you have within you, and you won't do it. You won't be able to do it. It's going to lead you to be frustrated. Your plans will be thwarted and you'll think, what's the point of trying? Because that's not the way that we defeat temptation. Not in our own strength. Who will deliver me from this body of death? It's Jesus. Thanks be to him. He is the one. Our Lord Jesus Christ. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. And so there's newness in us. And whilst the old man will still be there lusting after sin, that can be mortified, crucified with Christ. Because we have the promise that sin shall not reign over us. And therefore we must not present our bodies, our members, uh, as to be instruments to sin. See we constantly must go back to Christ. Constantly going back to him. Um, not simply following his example. But going to him. For strength. And for grace. He alone. Is able to withstand the evil one. But also in him. We shall have. The victory. May we find him. To be our help. May we find him to be our victory. Amen.